Good morning, church. It is Valentine's weekend. Oh, the joy of it. Uh, I don't know what you did to celebrate, to tell your love how much you are loved. Maybe you were hoping that somebody loved you and would remember you, and they didn't. I'm sorry. We didn't get the letter out soon enough, because we love you all. We really do. And I can say from Chris and I, for sure, we love you lots, and uh, we appreciate that you trust us with these moments every Sabbath, that you come expecting that you will hear from the Word of God and that you will be uplifted and encouraged. That is our definite hope. And I uh, want to thank uh, Eric, who strove with me this, this time to figure, figure out if you had a chance, as you were looking in your, in your hymn book, was that uh, offering him not so amazing? I mean, it was so amazing that you could see all of the writing in it. How many of you noticed that it was written by St. Columba? The tune is named St. Columba, and uh, musicians tend to notice these things, but I also noticed that it was a good ancient Irish tune. Uh, nice to know that there is that still in our past and that it can be useful for our present. Um, once again, I'm very glad to say that um, the worship committee that met this week uh, or a little bit, a little bit ago <coughs> is very interested in making sure that there is a variety of things that happen on a Sabbath morning so that, you know, coming from week to week, you probably won't know exactly what's going to happen, uh, except if you know Eric, or you know Pete, or you know Brett, or you know Naomi, and you know these individuals and, and what they like to choose from. So there is a variety that happens here at our church, and we're, we're feeling like that is helpful, because if you are like me, uh, if you do the same thing over and over and over again, sometimes it just might get a little boring. Uh, so we're interested in, in keeping things lively. In my prayer, you may have noticed the words that we have been focusing on in the last several weeks, and this is the culmination of that. And it was something that I, I would say, you know, in those moments, maybe you have these moments, I hope you do, when... God gives you some in inspiration. And, and you would think, oh, well, the pastor gets inspiration all the time. Uh, no, not necessarily. Sometimes it's really hard to <clears throat> just figure on what it is that I need to say. Uh, doesn't always just come, you know. This time it did, though, in the sense that God knows, if you were here uh, a month, at the beginning of the month, God knows he knows everything, we decided. God feels, yes, as we focus on God and we start thinking maybe a little more this year from the perspective of God, since we spend so much time thinking about ourselves, it's one of the reasons I really like Valentine's Day, because it's a day in which we, we are outward focused, we're wanting to say something to someone else about how we feel about them. Well, God has done the same thing. He feels about us in ways that are hard to describe sometimes as you get to know God and you get to know really how different He is and how, how amazing He is. The more you get to know that, the more you are just amazed, as am I, that He would, A, have made us in His image, B, have given us the opportunity to feel things like he feels them. But often I think sometimes we, we don't uh, ascribe, we don't give God the time. Maybe we don't even think that he has feelings. But this, this month we have reminded ourselves that God, God feels towards us in so many ways. And we should... I think we should remember that, maybe especially on Valentine's, that God has feelings. 
And he has tremendous feelings towards us. And those feelings then begin to express themselves towards us, as we, as we talked about last week, in the fact that God has wishes. I don't know about you, but when you know something about somebody and then you start to have feelings towards that individual, you start to want to express yourself towards that individual and you have wishes for how that expression might be received in a relationship, then things begin to happen. And so we find ourselves in Second Chronicles today. And you say, oh my goodness, I didn't even know there was a book in the Bible called Chronicles. Well, yeah, it, it, it does sound like something that you know, would be associated with Harry Potter or something, but uh, that's, that's kind of cool, right? Because the Bible says, too, that there's nothing new under the sun, and, and, and all the cool stuff actually can, can probably be found in the Bible first. And if you must know my opinion about Hollywood, I think that they, they get all their best stuff from the stories in the Bible. They really do. And here is one of them. It's... It's a story that, that focuses our attention actually on the doing. Because today we're talking about the fact that God will. See, the progression that he gave me was he knows, he feels, he wishes, and therefore this is what he's going to do. This is, the, this is the will. This is what he wants to do. Again, you know, we don't take maybe as much time as we ought to, to really try to get into the mind of God. But here's what happened. David became king of Israel after Saul. By the way, what number of, of king was David? He was number two. Who was number one? Saul. Uh, was Okay, just a quick question. Was, was Saul... Uh, somebody that you would put on the front cover of GQ magazine? The correct answer is yes. Saul was tall, dark, and handsome. Literally. The Bible says he was a head and shoulders taller than most guys. So you looked up to Saul. But remember that the people of Israel, and I'm, I'm telling you this because it, it, it makes huge, it's hugely important to what comes next. The people of Israel had asked Samuel to give them a king so they could be like the other nations around them. This piece is hugely important when you think about what we are reading today in Chronicles. Samuel was upset. Samuel was feeling like he had been demoted. Samuel was feeling like he had been rejected. And God had to come to him and say, Samuel, it's, it's not you that, that these individuals, these people of mine, that I have a special relationship with here on planet Earth, these people of mine have not rejected you, Samuel. You're just the mouthpiece. You're just the prophet. They have rejected me. Pretty sad story to be remembering on Valentine's weekend. You're talking about a God who's talking to his, his man, his, his mouthpiece, saying, I've been rejected, dude. That's, that's how God felt, even though he knows everything, that's how he felt when the people of Israel asked for a king. And he had the grace... Okay? Have you ever thought about the fact that when you ask God for something and he really doesn't want to give it to you, but then he turns around and he doesn't just give it to you, he really gives you an amazing answer to your prayer. And you think, oh, wow, isn't God wonderful? He answered my prayer. Have you ever thought about the fact that maybe he didn't want to give it to you? He really didn't want to give a king to Israel. He wanted to have a personal, intimate relationship with them. He did not want somebody standing in between him and his people. Kind of like you'd feel if, you know, your honey said, uh, you know, I really like this other guy. Can, can he be part of our relationship too? 
Maybe that's why the first commandment is there. You know, no other lovers, my version. Okay? If we're going to have a relationship, God says, no, no one in between us, no other lovers except me. Take all the other pictures out of your wallet. Come on now. Delete them off of your phone. Just me. This is what God says. And so when the people of Israel came and said, we want a king, they were basically saying, we want someone else other than you. Because the other people over there, they have somebody that they can look up to. And God was nice about it. He gave them Saul. Saul was good for a while. And then he fulfilled the prophecy that Samuel made and he employed all of the young men in armies that went out and many of them never came home. He put taxes on the people. This they all said, this Samuel had said would happen and the people had said, that's okay, we don't care. We just want a king. So they got a king. Saul goes off the scene in a blaze of, what are you going to call it? Do you remember how he died? After having gone to see the witch of Endor? Tomorrow, that apparition that told him that he thought was Samuel, tomorrow you're going to die. Anyone here like to know when they're going to die? He died fighting next to his son. And when he knew that the battle was done for him and his son, they both fell on their swords. They did not want to know what the Philistines were going to do with them. And it was a gallant, valiant group who went through the night after that battle and took the headless, footless bodies of Saul and Jonathan off of the gates of Gath, I believe. Because of the ignominy of having left their king in pieces, which is what the Philistines did to them. Ooh, you didn't know that, you know, Terminator and Dirty Harry were in the Bible, right? Yes. Yes. Like I said, Hollywood gets it, all its best stuff from the Bible. David becomes king. He has already been anointed. You know this. You know this because David is part of Saul's army until Saul realizes David's going to be the king next. And, and, and so then he tries to hunt him down. David becomes king. And he takes a few years to become king of the entire group. Not only Judah, but also of Israel. He is asked by both groups to become king. Maybe you didn't know that. He hung out in Hebron for seven years before he was anointed by both groups and became king over all Israel. The reign of David, we know, is wonderful. And he was, uh, as we know from Scripture, a man after God's own heart. It was a love relationship between David and God. Things were going swimmingly. He's getting older, and he suddenly realizes, you know, uh, I live in a better house than God lives in. This, this mustn't be. God still lives in a tent, and I live in a palace. No, no, we can't have this. So he purposes in his heart to build God a temple. Can't go into it all today. Please read the books of Samuel and you'll know the story of David. But God comes to him and says, David, your hands are red. Yes, on Valentine's weekend we can talk about the fact that red is the color of blood. Blood is what goes through the heart. And this weekend we're talking about love and we're talking about the heart. We've just sung about the fact that when there's love at home, David is disappointed. 
but he starts the amassing of all the stuff that is going to be necessary. He taps this, this contact and, and this person over here. Would you provide the wood? Would you provide the stone masons? He starts gathering things together and he is in the process of gathering that which he will not be able to build. When, as the Bible says, he is gathered unto his fathers. A euphemistic phrase for he died. They mourned him, and then Solomon is crowned king. Okay, so I've been making reference to this. This is kind of more of an R-rated movie piece. David and Bathsheba. Remember that story? Okay, so their first child, the one that she told him about before her husband came home from the battle. Remember that one? The one that David decided to cover up by bringing Uriah home and then colluding with Joab to have him murdered. Remember that story? That child died, as predicted. David didn't want it to happen, but it did. So I'm telling you, this is pain. This is huge, huge pain, okay? But it's pain born of selfishness and and lust. But guess who the second son of Bathsheba was? Solomon. I don't know if you're you're picking this up, but but these stories that, that, that... if you go into the details and you understand how things happen, you realize that they were just as complicated. Things between God and his people, things between the king and God were just as complicated as they are today. The political intrigue that happens is just as twisted and and, and as fierce as it was in the days of David, as it is today. So you have David dying and you have Solomon, not his eldest son from his oldest wife, which would normally have been the, the one to succeed him. No, he says Solomon is because Bathsheba is my favorite. This is the wife that he stole from Uriah. Imagine that being your legacy. I am the son of the wife that my father stole from another man. If we had somebody trying to be a member of this church who had that kind of legacy, would, would the board think twice? <laughs> of course they would. Which is why I say, if you want some Sabbath reading, go to Hebrews chapter 11. We call it the Hall of Fame for Faith. Just look at each and every one of those names and then the stories associated with them and you will see that to have faith in God in this day and age, my friends, takes huge courage. Because it's just as complicated, just as as crazy as it was back then. Now, it's, it's just that crazy. So if you think that the you know, the internet has speeded things up. Maybe, it's, maybe what it's done is it's just revealed all of our stories, you know, especially for those who live on Twitter and Facebook and others. They're telling their stories, and we know, you know, like, like Facebook has introduced us to, it's complicated. Can't tell you all the details, but it's complicated, which is, we know now, a euphemistic phrase for saying it's also painful. It's also hard. Here we are. Solomon now has built the temple. This is is a temple which in history was said to be one of the seven wonders of the world. It was magnificent by historical recollection and artistic uh, representation. But it no longer exists. Listen to what God says to Solomon. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out, this is 
uh, Second Chronicles 7, if you want to follow along, verses 11 and on. Succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind. That was a great mind, by the way, because this is the mind that God had, had offered him anything in the world. And Solomon said, I choose wisdom, please. And God said, oh, oh, good choice. And I'm going to give you everything else as well. Wouldn't you love to have that be the way that you were treated if you had to choose something from God? The Lord appeared to him at night. So now he's having a vision. This is the situation. I heard your prayer and have chosen this place. He's built this temple. I've chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. By the way, the temple is built on Mount what? Moriah. What else happened on Mount Moriah? Abraham and Isaac. Isn't, I think God has, has a, a wonderful sense of direction and humor and history. I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place. Verse 13, when I shut up the heavens so that there was no rain or commanded locusts to devour the land or sent a plague among my people, just hold there for a second and remind the dear brothers and sisters who read their Bibles and believe that God never does anything bad. That the New Testament God is all about this soft version of love. Just remind them of this text, okay? This is God talking now, and he has claimed that he has sent no rain and that he has sent the locusts to devour and has sent plague, actually, amongst his people. If my people, here's the text now, this is the one that has been put to song and, and, and is just such a powerful piece, not only at this moment when he's dedicating the temple, but I'm hoping that it will sink into our hearts today on Valentine's weekend, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Amen. Now those who've heard this many, many times, this, 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 is, this is a piece of Romantic. It's, al it's almost romantic, but understand what he is saying. You, you, have been, you have been a people who have been far away from me, and I have sent plagues, and I have sent locusts on you, because that was what I did to reprove you, that was what I did to get your attention, to bring you back to me. Please don't miss the very first word of... Verse 14, it's a two-letter word which shows up again later. If, my friends, what is happening here is conditional. I would love a relationship with you, he is saying to his people. I would, and he's saying it to us this morning. I would love a relationship with you. But here's, here's the deal. You want the deal? Here's the deal. You have to turn from your wicked ways. Then he says, I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. And I just want to remind you, my definition of sin is very simple. Divorce. And I don't mean divorce in the sense that we're thinking about it. I mean that you tell God to take a hike. Okay, that's what the people of God had done in the way that they had lived their lives. And you know this because this is now Solomon, king number three in a dynasty which God has allowed, even though he didn't want to. So God is, God is now dealing with a people who are not really loving him. Again, I, I know this may not have been the Valentine's sermon that you wanted to hear, but this is what God said to me, so I'm saying it to you. If my people who are called by my name, who have 
my name as their name too. This is John Jacob Jingleheimer Smith stuff. His name is my name too. So if you call yourself today, if you call yourself a Christian, you are calling yourself by the name of the Messiah. I like the, I like the phrase God-fearer, God-fearer. Because I believe that there are many people who do not call themselves Christians who actually are God-fearers. They know God. They may, may not just want to be labeled by the label that we are ready to accept. Okay, be, be generous. Be generous like that. Be looking, as I would say, for people who maybe were in the category that's talked about in Romans chapter 1, who have understood God from nature. By the way, nature is God's first book. The Bible is his second book. When he couldn't get through to us with nature, he had to have prophets come and tell us verbally and or have visions but Romans chapter 1 says that people can know God from his creation. I think that should be very uh, satisfying for us who believe in a creator God. Adventists are interested in telling people about the first angel's message which says, quick test, fear God. Which God? The God who made heaven and earth. So Adventists... Seventh-day people should be very interested in anything to do with creation. Because it is, it is the creator God that we are talking about here. It is the creator God who is having this relationship with the people of Israel. It is the creator God who wants a relationship with us. And now he is saying, he is saying to us, if my people, so people, listen up. If my people want to receive my valentine, Turn from your wicked ways, and then I will hear from heaven. Do you know, I, I want to just say, I think wicked ways is, it's not all the deep, dark secrets. It could easily be the way I think about people when they cut me off in traffic. Do you know, I, I think that it's, it's maybe easier to accept if we realize that the general way in which life is operated here on earth might just have as its basis no relationship to this God of heaven that wants to have a relationship with us because it's all about us. So wicked, you know, we think icky thoughts when we use the word wicked, and we don't want to be wicked, but why don't we just say it like it is? It's, it's us being selfish. That's what it is. So maybe, maybe that's a little softer, or maybe it's a little sharper. I don't know. You decide. I, I know how I feel about it, but you decide how you feel about the fact that he says we will need to turn from doing life in the way that you have been doing it. Okay? You wanted a king. Where has that got you? You wanted to be like the other nations. Where has that got you? You turn from your wicked ways and hear from heaven, just like you did before when you had prophet Samuel around. You hear directly from heaven and I will forgive their sin, their, 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 their broken relationship with me, and I will heal their land. And then he says, now my eyes will be open and my ears will be attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Do you know what that's basically saying? My eyes were closed before and my ears were stopped up. You were praying, I wasn't listening. Did you, did you ever believe that God would say that to you? It's right here. I have chosen, this is a choice God makes, and consecrated this temple so that my name, capital N, 
may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. You want to know where God's heart is? It's, we say, here, because he wants to dwell here. We want to say that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that is the new, shall we say, New Testament understanding. But here he's talking about an actual place, an actual situation where people were going to offer sacrifices. Didn't Eric just lead us into an opportunity to sacrifice to the Lord this morning? Did you ever think that the offering part of the ceremony that we do every Sabbath, like this program, that it actually offers you an opportunity to bring your sacrifices, your tithes, your offerings? Your... We did it this morning. Please don't forget that. That's why we include that part every Sabbath, is you have an opportunity to bring your sacrificial offering. To the God of heaven, just like in Bible times. So God says, this place is going to be the place where I will receive those sacrifices. I will receive them and my eyes, uh, 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 my eyes and my heart will always be there. You know, God chose a people. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, these are, the, these are the patriarchs that begin this whole people. But he chooses these people because he wants to have a relationship with a group of humans and he wants them to be an example to all the rest of the humans in the, in the, world, in the earth, on the earth. And, and he, he wants them to show what it is like to live together with God, even though... There is an evil tyrant who is trying to pull all humanity away from God. And boy, does he do a good job. He did a good job then. He's doing a good job now. And, and as we walk out this door today, maybe even now, we are being, temp we are being tempted by that evil tyrant who wants nothing else but to destroy our relationship with the one who can save us, the one who has already given us eternal life. He is such a spoiler. Folks, he is such a spoiler. He knows that you have something that he does not and that he can never have. You have eternal life. What, you're not that excited? If I said, you have $100,000 each today, collect your check on the way out. <laughs> oh yeah, see, there's a different reaction, right? <laughs> but I just told you <laughs> that you have eternal life. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> this, this, my friends, this, my friends, is the news this is the news that we need to be sharing with those who have been mangled by this tyrant whose lives are a mess. And they have absolutely no way of knowing how to get out of that mess. We see them every day. There are colleagues at work. There are our, our, our kith and kin. Maybe you even sent a valentine to one of these individuals hoping that they would feel better. Oh, I love you. And you knew that that was going to be like a tiny little band-aid on a huge gash. You knew that. But you still sent that valentine. You still hoped that it would stop the bleeding just a little bit because that person's life is like an open wound. That person's life is just, just ebbing out of them in ways that they don't want and that you would really like to help, but you just don't know how. Well, I've got good news that you can share with those individuals in your life like that. Even if that is you, I've got good news for you this morning that there is a God in heaven who wants to dwell in your heart. Amen. He would love to have the Holy Spirit be a real influence uh, to speak with you directly. He would love you to know that his angels will be around you to protect you and that if necessary, he 
he will even send angels that exceed in strength to protect you. It's not for no reason that when I pray here on Sabbath mornings that I include the fact that we just don't know what could have happened to us this week. You think, I think that our lives just go on like they do and that they will go on. There were people this week that found out that they had cancer. There were people this week that had accidents. There were people this week who, who got murdered. I don't know. I, didn't, I, I don't know that for sure. Maybe it didn't happen this week. But it happened last week. And good odds that it's going to happen next week. So, so here is a God who says, now... In this place, at this time, right, right here, in, in your mind and your heart, I want you to, to be in a relationship with me. Don't wait. Let's, let's be part of eternity together. My friends, uh, uh, that, you know, we, we, have a, we have a timeline that we often talk about as far as the second coming. You know, we're Adventists. We're looking forward to the second coming. And we say, you know, the second coming is going to happen and then it's going to be the thousand years and, and then there's going to be another resurrection, the second resurrection, and then, then there's going to be this fiery cleansing of the world and, <laughs> and then there's going to be a recreation. And we all go, <sighs> yeah. I've decided. I want to see it all. I want to see it all. I don't want to be part of the second resurrection and miss out on what happens in the thousand years. I don't want to be, I don't want to miss anything. And, 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 and the, the good news today that I want you to take away is that, that the, the heart of God wants for you to be able to see all of that. I, I'm especially excited about the recreative part. People, people hear lots of sermons about the fiery uh, cleansing. Okay? And they want to think that this is going to be something that will go on and on and on forever. I don't see that being what God wants. I, I think he wants to get it over with and then move on to the next piece, which is recreation of the world. Back to its pristine condition, exactly like it was when he gave it to Adam and Eve. In fact, Ellen White tells us they will recognize Eden. They will recognize the flowers and the trees that were there. So where did Eden go? I don't know. I don't care. We're going to see it again. If you, if you believe the gospel, which is that Jesus loves you, died to save you, and is coming back to get you, if you believe that gospel, you will see all these things. I have determined that there is nothing that this tyrant in this world, this spoiler, can do to take away my belief in that happening. Now, that's a tough thing to say. Because I have friends who have given up. I have friends and family who have given up. So I'm here today to encourage you. I'm here today to tell you once again, Jesus loves you. And because he loves you, he laid voluntarily laid down his life and then took it up again and then said, if I do this, you can do this through my power and that we can live face to face Someday very soon. You, you, you knew there was a but, right? Here's the but. We get to start now. Please don't think that this is something that you will only get to do when you see Jesus face to face. We get to live with him now. And that's a choice that you make every day. You wake up in the morning and you say, God, thank you that I'm alive. What do you want me to do today? Who do you want me to meet? I want to go on God's errands. We can do that this week.
I don't know, maybe coming up shortly, we should have a time when I take a microphone around this, this place and, and you'll, I, I'll, I'll give you some warning, I promise. Or maybe I'll break that promise. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I'll take it to Barry and I'll say, Barry, when you were driving this week, um, uh, what did God say to you? And, and, and did you do it? Now, I hope, you know, if I get to you, you can say, yep, I did it. And boy, this was amazing what happened. And then tell a story about what happens when you do what God asks you to do because you are part of his kingdom, because you are in love with him. I don't know. I think that would really be an amazing, an amazing church service. And I know you've heard enough from me, so I will just tell you once again, God loves you. God wants to spend this next week with you. And he really also wants to spend eternity with you. So if that doesn't beat all, then uh, I just have to feel sorry for you.